welcome to Daily Debrief brought to you by People's Dispatch. I'm Pragya. Germany has decided it will send battle tanks to Ukraine. Reports say it aims to change the scope of the Russia-Ukraine war and will reshape Germany's role in Europe. We go to Lebanon next, where an investigation has resumed after a 13-month hiatus into the blast that killed 220 people in Beirut. And finally, as fans returned in masses to football stadia after COVID-19, football clubs gained, says a ranking of football clubs by Deloitte. Nearly a year after the Russian attack on Ukraine began, Germany has decided to send 14 Leopard tanks to Ukraine. It will also allow other countries to send their tanks. The US is also expected to announce dispatching its Abrams tanks. It would seem Germany has overcome reluctance to ship tanks into that battlefront. These concerns stemmed from its relationship with Russia and the role it saw for itself in Europe over close to a century. We talked to Prabhi Purkaista about this development. Right, Prabhi, thanks for joining us. Prabhi, Germany's decision to send tanks, now they seem to have cogitated and agitated over it for a while. What finally seems to have swung it one way? Well, you know, there were, uh, Germany was saying that, okay, we'll send the tanks, provided the United States also sends its Abraham tanks. So that is one part of the issue. And we'll come to that in a minute. The second part is, is Germany worried about the escalation with Russia to the point that it will lead to a ground war in Europe? Right. And the consequences of that could very easily escalate to a nuclear exchange. And then of course, we know what is the, uh, what will happen after that. The fact that it is a destruction of the civilization as we know it. It will happen in Europe, but it will affect everybody in the same way. It is not going to be restricted to Europe alone. So I think to some extent it was also worry of that. And as a part of it is also the Green Minister, the Baerbeck, actually making the statement, yes, we'll allow Poland to give uh, Leopard 2s, uh, Germany will allow. That put him on the spot that he was the one who was the holdout. Right. And also therefore made it even more difficult for them to say, okay, Poland can give Leopard 2s, but Germany can't. So all of this was one part of it. The other part of it, and I'm always a little uh, skeptical about all of this, is that there is an export market. In Germany, Leopard 2 tanks are sold widely to its allies, of course, to others also in the global market, because American tanks are pretty expensive. And okay. because of the expense of the Abram tanks, they're not such a hot item for sale. Now, if they go to war, Leopard 2 goes to war, and Russia destroys them uh, res reasonably easily, then of course the export market drops. Absolutely. Now the Abraham tanks then become the dominant player in the market. That might be a consequence. They said, okay, we'll send Le Leopard 2 tanks, but you send your tanks as well. So if we suffer, both of us suffer the same market blow. So it could be also a marketing issue because let's face facts. 50, 100 tanks is not going to change the course of war in Ukraine. These are tanks which are going in with not so much of trained manpower behind it because Germans and Americans and Polish personnel are not going to be in those tanks Absolutely. unless they go as mercenaries. So it is going to be Ukraine people who are not so familiar with the tanks. They are more familiar with the older Russian tanks, T-72s and the various versions thereof. This T-72 is the main battle tank, so are these two. So is the T-90, the latest uh, version that has come out of Russia, out of the old 272 tanks. So main, in, in that sense, they are not familiar with these tanks. So Russians' use of these tanks could also mean that, uh, sorry, the, Ukraine. Ukrainians' use of this tank. Therefore, the Ukrainian use of these tanks might mean that they will suffer losses and relatively early losses. So given that, I don't think it's going to make that much of a difference to the war itself, even if they were run by Americans because, or Germans, because we have seen that the German Leopards as well as the American tanks have suffered badly in various wars. Turkey, in fact, had Leopard 2 tanks. ISIS hunted them down with relatively uh, not very expensive weapons. You had also, we have also seen the Abraham tanks being used by Saudi Arabia. They were also, the Houthis uh, took care of them. So none of these 
tanks in current war are invincible. It's not like the old, uh, you know, Second World War scenario. Anti-tank weapons work. And therefore, if uh, they come onto the battlefield, I don't think there's going to be a qualitative change to the war scenario. It's still going to be a slog between the two armies. It's still going to be largely a ground war. And the tanks would have limited impact. Don't forget. Ukraine has, this is the third tank army they are trying to build. They had the tank from earlier uh, times, okay. which was Ukraine's originally, they had something like 700, 800 tanks. They lost that in the first set of battles itself. Then the European countries replenished with their Soviet era tanks, which is mm -hmm. Poland, Estonia, uh, other countries. They gave them a bunch of tanks, which was, as I said, the old Russian tanks. They also, that was also lost by Ukraine. So this is a third set of tanks now they're going to get from some from Poland, Leopard 2 again, some from Germany, some from the United States. So this is the third lot of tanks they're going to get, the third tank army they're trying to build. What will happen is that yes, they'll have some success initially, but it's not going to make a qualitative difference. The numbers are too small. Russian right. tank army is much bigger. They are the T-92 tanks, which are quite uh, the same caliber, give or take uh, a little. So I don't think this going to change the. It will go to change sub anything in the battlefield in an, any significant sense. So that's that's where it is. So I think the issue is of the tanks is more of optics, and the fact that Ukraine feels that without this they really have no recourse, no ability to capture further ground. And therefore, they desperately need this to keep, if nothing else, their spirits up. Right, Prabir. Thank you very much for joining us. A trial has unexpectedly resumed in the blast that occurred in Beirut's port area in 2020. The investigation stalled as various political factions in Lebanon contested how to go about it. These being investigated include top Lebanese officials. Some arrested after the blasts were also recently released. More than 220 people died in that explosion. We go over to Abdul from People's Dispatch. Abdul, what is the latest on the investigation into the blast at the port in 2020? Uh, as per the reports, it seems that the judge uh, Tariq Bittar has basically uh, charged, formally charged, uh, former Prime Minister Hassan Diab and some of his cabinet colleagues, former, of course, former ministers in his uh, government along with uh, the state, uh, uh, higher state officials, a number of them, more than a dozen of them. And uh, all of them have been charged with homicide uh, in the, uh, and held responsible for the blast in which more than uh, 200 people were killed and thousands of the uh, Lebanese uh, were uh, injured. Um, the fact is uh, that uh, uh, the state's prosecutor general has a question the some uh, the discharging by Hassan Bitar, who was basically, according to uh, what the prosecutor general is saying, that uh, he 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 has been suspended. Uh, uh, his inquiry has been suspended uh, uh, pending uh, uh, the court cases uh, in the uh, uh, for last uh, almost a year and a half. Uh, uh, which was filed by Hezbollah and other uh, political groups accusing Hassan Bitar for bias uh, and uh, pursuing political agenda instead of doing investigation. So on that particular uh, uh, note, despite the fact that his uh, the courts have not given any verdict on those uh, uh, legal uh, those cases, and despite the fact that uh, uh, state has not revoked the suspension. Uh, uh, on Monday, uh, uh, Bitar uh, suddenly resumed, uh, announced the resumption of investigation. And on Tuesday, he uh, basically uh, uh, filed the charges against uh, uh, the Ab and other people. So uh, it is a, a, a peculiar situation uh, in Lebanon as that this moment, where, uh, of course, there are uh, thousands of Lebanese who are seeking justice, who are seeking accountability for what happened in 2020. But uh, there is a legal uh, issue. There is a question of the the uh, the, uh, the legitimacy of the so-called inquiry process, and so called uh, the, so the charges framed against Hassan Diab and his colleagues uh, uh, look sensational, but actually do not have any legal uh, value. Yeah. 
can you talk about abdul how this case actually came to be in a state of suspension and you know also how it came to be revived well as i just mentioned uh, after the blast uh, on august 4 uh, 2020 there were massive uh, public uh, there was massive public outrage uh, uh people demanded some kind of accountability this will not go where more than 30000 people were displaced uh, uh, because their homes were destroyed uh, or another infrastructure was destroyed beirut lost billions of dollars of property in those blasts and someone of course uh, should should be held responsible so with that uh, those public uh, under the public pressure in uh, the state at that time prime minister hasan dia constituted an inquiry commission uh, which soon had to resign following the the allegations by hizbullah and other political groups some other political groups in lebanon uh, which questioned who questioned uh, the legitimacy and the processes which were adopted by the inquiry commission at the time uh, then finally uh, uh, with bitar was appointed in december 2020 he was again uh, uh, accused of uh, pursuing political agenda pursuing in fact hizbullah claimed that he is pursuing us agenda uh, those who know lebanese politics uh, understand that uh, the politics in lebanon is quite divided uh, there are sections which are considered to be pro us there are sections which are considered to be anti us uh, aligned with different uh, regional uh, 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 players and powers therefore it it becomes quite normal which in other societies will be quite absurd to assume in lebanon it becomes quite normal to accuse each other of pursuing a foreign uh, country's agenda so hizbullah and other uh, uh, players accused hasan uh, sorry the uh, judge uh, bitar that he is basically uh, doing politics instead of doing investigation and he is biased against them and they went to court filed uh, uh, cases uh those cases are still pending uh, because the judge which was hearing the cases uh uh, uh got retired or uh, or removed and there has been no new fresh appointment at his place so the case is still pending uh, uh and despite uh, uh, and the popular pressure is still there uh there have been demonstrations held again and again demanding accountability and justice so it seems that uh, uh, bitar's move on monday is a part of uh, 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 that it can it can uh, be uh, interpreted in either ways that uh, due to the public pressure or due to some kind of uh, uh, pressure from somewhere else which basically led to the resumption of investigation uh, uh, without state sanction on monday all right abdul thanks a lot for that update For the second time in a row Manchester City generated the highest revenue in world football clubs that's one of the findings of the Deloitte Money League ranking of clubs for 2023 it clocked a revenue of 731 million euros a 13% jump over the previous year we talked to Siddhant Ane about whether there are any other surprises in the report Siddhant thanks for joining us Siddhant what does the report uh, say actually about the state of football Uh, football clubs after covid-19 uh, pragya you know uh, on on daily brief we talked uh, i think a few weeks ago uh, when davos was kicking off uh, about oxfam's uh, global inequality report uh, it was called i think a survival of the richest and uh, uh, football as we've said many times on on various platforms where uh, we bring our perspective to sport uh, is a, a microcosm that pretty much reflects what's happening in the outside world Uh, in in at least this regard so uh, the top 20 uh, earning clubs in world football uh, generated a revenue this is of course for the last season that that's gone by uh, uh, which finished about 8 months ago uh, a total revenue of over 9 billion euro uh, which puts uh, the industry as such back at pre pandemic levels so so the positive in that sense from a uh, very very broad perspective is that the football industry is back to where it was before the pandemic uh, but if you go into the details of this report it tells us what we already know which is that much of this revenue goes to a very select group of clubs in very select leagues uh, all of which are in europe uh, like you were mentioning uh, in your 
intro, uh, the figure of 731 uh, million euros for Manchester City, uh, a staggering figure. And we'll, we'll talk about how this compares to women's clubs uh, a little bit later on. Uh, but even clubs like uh, Tottenham and Arsenal, uh, both clubs based in North London uh, and traditional rivals, who haven't won a major trophy since, you know, God knows when, uh, are generating revenues of 400 and 500 million euros every year. Uh, now, the interesting part in this, because we talk so much about how much the game is driven by fans and all of that, uh, is that only about 15% on average of revenue generated by these big clubs comes from match day activities, right. which means the sale of tickets, programs, uh, food and beverage, that kind of stuff on match days. The rest of it, uh, w which w would be what, 75% uh, uh, comes from uh, commercial activities. So, essentially advertising and broadcast revenues. So so the entire game is a television game. And we were saying this also during the pandemic that the, the top clubs are actually pretty happy with not having fans or the media in stadiums at all uh, because it's a lot less effort for them uh, compared to what they get back in return in terms of money, which is what these clubs are. These are pro most of them are pro uh, for profit clubs. Uh, they are being run as businesses and they are very much a part of the entertainment industry uh, which is how we should look at big sport uh, today. So, you know, th there was this whole debate going on about the Super League, uh, a breakaway league uh, that was hoping to entice some of these top 20 to say that yeah, if we are earning the revenue, let us keep the profit also. Forget about this whole complete idea of any kind of trickle-down economics at all, you know, to help with the rest of the leagues. Uh, that is happening anyway, pretty much, uh, is what we are seeing uh, from this report, this is of course one report generated by Deloitte and I think Deloitte's UK branch. But uh, but there are a series of similar reports, studies done by FIFA, UEFA, various other entities that all point in very much the same direction. Uh, that at the grassroots level, at the mass level, uh, the, the sport is sustained by community activity, people's participation, uh, uh, volunteer activity, all that kind of things. While these few big super rich clubs generate ridiculous amounts of money and then circulate it in various ways uh, amongst themselves. So, in that sense, football, men's football particularly, provides mm -hmm. a really uh, interesting bite-sized chunk in which to analyze how global financial systems and, and capitalism at, at, at large uh, actually functions. Uh, so, so, the idea that football is this mass sport and, you know, everyone has the hope of climbing up the pyramid and eventually earning as much money as Manchester City it's a, it's a lot of bullshit, forgive, forgive my language, uh, because the domination of these clubs is absolute and the way uh, the structure has been built uh, for generations and most, mostly because it's dominated by, uh, by European broadcasters and, and essentially all Europeans, uh, it will remain this way unless there is some kind of revolution which no one is really asking for except the richest who want an even bigger chunk of the pie for themselves. So that is, in essence, the summary of this report, uh, at least from my perspective. Right, right, Sadan. Sadan, what about the state of women's football? What does the report say? It's actually pretty damning, Pragya. I mean, you can look at it from the perspective that there are marginal improvements. Uh, first, firstly, this is, I think, the first time that any study at all is being done of this kind to look at what clubs in women's football are actually doing. But uh, FC Barcelona Women, which is the top uh, revenue-generating women's football club in the world, uh, generates about 7.7 .7 million euros, which is 100 times less than the figure we talked about uh, right. with Manchester City's men's team. So that is the difference in terms of uh, money. And largely this comes because uh, mostly men in suits uh, run the system in terms of marketing, broadcasting, all of that. And therefore, there's this belief that no one watches women's football. So why spend any money on broadcasting it? Why telecast it to, uh, you know, why telecast the uh, women's Premier League to Asia? Uh, who, who cares? Nobody wants to watch it. So till uh, so and 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 it goes a step further actually, uh, where you, whether you talk about the number of women who are present on the boards of these money clubs, uh, All right. the figure is that uh, let around the 10% mark, which is, if you look at the, let's say, the FTSE 100, which is which is the index, uh, the, the, the UK index 
uh, there you have 40% uh, representation of women on the boards of these uh, FTSE 100 listed companies. So, so football is really lagging really far behind in terms of bringing women into the, into the game. And it, it's really bizarre to understand because uh, on the one hand, so many of the global leaders of the sport are fighting to increase revenues. On the other hand, you're ignoring half of the world's population and not even trying to seriously engage with them. So even from a pure capitalist point of view, I, I really can't fathom why that's happening. And, and this also extends to ethnic diversity, by the way. Uh, many of these clubs, including clubs that claim to be global football clubs, mm -hmm. uh, have you know abysmal numbers when it comes to uh, ethnic diversity representation on their boards and in senior uh, leadership. So while the, the teams that they field might be diverse, might be players from all over the world, uh, different, every different continent might be playing for one club uh, in Europe. But when it comes to decision making, when it comes to the, the guys who are calling the shots, it is still largely uh, white men that are uh, doing those jobs. All right. Uh, Sadhan, thanks a lot for joining us. And that's a wrap for today. Thank you for watching Daily Debrief. Do come back to us tomorrow. You can find our stories on peoplesdispatch.org and our social media updates on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram.